Hi, this is John from Sharp Mountain Games, and today we're taking a look at White Hack by Christian Merstam. So here's White Hack by Christian Merstam, and on the front cover, it gives you an idea of um, how the um, character sheet's going to be set up, and then here's the back cover. And you may notice it kind of looks distressed. That's not because I don't take care of my books. I do try to take care of my books, or I didn't buy this used. I bought this brand new. But it's trying to look that way, to kind of look like it's been um, well used. So this is the third edition. Now, I don't think it differs strongly from the second edition, although the second edition, I think, was a little longer, a little more expensive because it had a setting that is going with it. And he mentioned that he's breaking out that setting um, separately uh, into a book called The White Curse. So you don't get that with the third edition, although I imagine there were some changes and tweaks from second edition. Now, the artwork in here. There's not a lot of it, and most of it looks like it's probably public domain um, artwork, you know, old woodcuts and old prints and things like that. So just to know, it's a lot of text. Um, it's not like um, getting a book with a ton, ton of artwork, you know, like a modern Wizards of the Coast type book. Now, what is White Hack? White Hack is an old school roll under system. But he does mention that he tries to do things a little bit differently in here than um, some of the others. So here's a list of the terminology that's used. Some examples of play to try and get you right out front to get an idea of, well, how does a miracle work or how does being attuned work and things like that. And let's get into character generation. So if anybody is familiar with um, old school D&D or any version of D&D, it's kind of the same. You roll for your attributes. If you want to use a different version, you absolutely can. If you want to use like a standard um, set a setup of numbers or, um, you know, roll four and drop the lowest or however you want to do that. It's all your standard strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Exactly like you would expect. Now, in terms of character classes, there's only three. There's the deft. Now, the deft are kind of like your thieves or your specialists, and they have special rules for attunement. So how does this work? So you can see every level, you have your how many hit dice, your attack value, you know, what do you have to roll under to attack, uh, saving throw. Now, slots are where you add things. So this is how many attunements you have once per day. So attunements are, use a special role for difficulty. So rather than giving you, say, an advantage dice, although they do use this in this system, um, if it's a, a nigh impossible task, you need a regular task roll. Hard tasks you just do automatically. And then a truly impossible you, you can't do. And your slots increase as you go along. And we'll talk about groups in a few minutes. The number of groups the character gets mechanical benefits from and when you can raise your attribute numbers. Now, one thing I should also mention is hit points are a little bit low. That's true in this system and many OSR systems, and sometimes folks will shy away from them because of that. However, there's certainly workarounds. You could start at level three, you know, and get more hit, hit points that way. You could do 10 plus the hit dice to start out with. You could do your constitution score as your starting hit points, and then you only add on there afterwards. So don't shy away from OSR systems um, just because they have those low hit points. They don't have to all be as lethal. They can be if that's your style of play, but they don't necessarily have to be. So here's your strong characters. They're your fighters and your knights and your paladins. And... Um, they have certain slots and tricks too, and they actually give you a lot of examples here. In fact, more examples than they do for the deft. I wish the deft had just a few more examples or possible um, sort of powers to go in those slots that you get. And you get more as you go along. Oh, and the levels go 1 through 10. And the wise are your wizards and your clerics, and they perform miracles. And we are going to talk about that in just a minute or so. So here's the miracles. The way miracles or spells work in this system is they cost you hit points. So if you want to do something simple, 
which are things like they could be achieved without magic, um, but might be better to do it with magic, like cure light wounds. Well, you could bandage them, but this will be a little quicker or light. It costs you one hit point. Some standard, like second level spells, those might be two. Major, like teleportation, that might be, or they're suggesting a D6 or a 2D6, so you could have some variable. Now, that's going to be a matter of, is this your style of play? Because you'd have to understand that while your fighter is going to be losing hit points being hit by the enemy or your deft character, if they engage the enemy, your magic user should not be in that battle. The magic user should be standing to the back because they're going to burn through hit points um, by casting these spells. Now, they do give you some suggestions. Like if you want to do traditional magic spells, like a level one spell, level one spell would cost one hit point. Level two spell would cost three, cost five. Um, so they do give you some um, suggestions about how to uh, integrate it with a more traditional spell system. Another option might be you could have, along with hit points, you could have magic points. And then they those would kind of work like your spell slots per day for um, old school magic users. And they talk about how to word your um, miracles here. So I think... In terms of um, this, you'd really have to talk to your players beforehand. Are they okay with a little bit more fuzziness in their magic system? Or if you want to use your traditional spells, you know, from a, another uh, system, you could do that too. But you'd need to have that conversation with your players right up front, I think. Now, groups are interesting because what groups do is you can belong to two or three groups and they give you advantage on certain roles. Really, these work a lot like aspects in the fate system where you have some descriptions about your character and there are certain situations where you can use them. So the first group that everybody gets is their species. So if you're a dwarf, you might roll with advantage for doing dwarfy things like, um, you know, analyzing stones and um, stonework and metalwork and things like that. Your vocation is things like are you a wizard or a barbarian or it even says a plumber or a swine herder? So it's give you a, that advantage, um, you know, in situations where that would apply. The wizard's going to know a lot of arcane knowledge and things like that. Uh, maybe your barbarian can track or can hunt better. And affiliations are if you belong to a group, um, you know, maybe you belong to a certain group of rangers or the harpers in the Forgotten Realms or something like that. And that can give you advantage in certain situations, too. And they give you some suggestions for your groups, like hypnotists and cultists and um, some species uh, suggestions here. And there's another one of those woodcuts. And there's your equipment list, exactly like you think. Um, if you want to modify or create your own weapons, armor class and languages and things like that. Now, armor class works differently in white hack it's a zero up system so what you do is it's roll under let's say you have a um, strength score of 14 so you're using that for your melee skill or an attack value of 14. so you would need to roll 14 or under but also above the armor class that you're fighting against and that seems different it seems like a little weird but some other roll under systems, they say, okay, we have a 14, but this guy's an armor class of three, so you have to roll 11 or under. You have to do that subtraction. With this zero up armor class, you don't have to do the subtraction, and it makes it much quicker in play. I have run uh, basically white hack or a version of white hack, and it works really simple. And the players can handle it. You just tell them roll under your score, but don't roll too low, and I'll tell you if it's too low. All right, here's some suggested character names. I always like that when you have that for a book. And um, I think for my next convention game, I'm going to bring along suggested names um, so that we don't get, I don't want to say dumb names, but ones that um, take you out of the immersion, you know, like Bob the Wookiee or something. Now, there's some example characters here. I think these could have been expressed, like some of them are a little weird. And in some cases, I was reading them. and It was hard for me to quite understand um, how he did this. I think this is a weak point in the book that the characters should have been a little more standard or at least explained a little better how to read their um, stat blocks here. And of course you can start higher if you want. 
Now, here's where you put your attributes here, your saving throw, and your attack value. I'm not sure if you're supposed to write them on these little lines or you'd write them outside here or maybe even inside. It's a little different. It's more like a clock. And then um, armor class, move, how many slots do you have, how many hit points, your abilities, and kind of your gear section. Now we get into the core rules. And for the most part, it runs very similar to any standard old school or um, you know D&D style game. So I'm not going to get into all of them. It is roll under. You can assign a difficulty class. So if you want a task to be especially difficult, basically you're giving it, like you might say, oh, this is a difficulty of three. So you have to roll under your attribute, but um, not below a three or three or below. So, uh, and another thing too for roll under, and some people really don't like this, is that the 20 is a failure. It's not a natural 20. Uh, you can do critical hits if you want. Um, they're optional here. Now, there's a way to use auctions. That's really unique to White Hack. And I, I'll be honest, I've never played with them. I had to read this two or three times to understand it. Um, I think it's okay. What it does is it sort of reduces a contest, like a gambling contest, or you could even do it with a battle, down to one roll. Whereas you're kind of making some bids, oh, I'm going to beat over this number. You know, I'm going to roll under, but I'm going to beat a particular number. Um, I don't use it myself. You can certainly try it if you like. I think it kind of takes out of the immersion a little bit. It kind of makes it a little more gamey. But certainly it's available to you if you want to give it a shot. Because um, it is time-saving. You know, if you want to just do a battle, like, really quick, you can do that. All right, so time and movement. And a lot of this is exactly what you would think. And combat. So you can see that, do you want to do a crit and fumble? You certainly can do that and add that in. And healing. This is something neat in the thing here. Is death is not necessarily absolute and permanent. Let's say a character dies in the middle of the dungeon. And you want to do, you don't know what to do there. You don't have an NPC handy. They can continue and um, fight along in ghost form for the rest of that session. So I think that's pretty neat. It's, it's something I've never seen in another book. Like, how do you do that? Um, but there are some rules, like the ghosts don't go through walls or closed doors. So they don't want to make it like, okay, you're dead and now you're super, super powerful. But it's a, kind of a neat way to think about continuing along. And magic items, and it gives you some optional rules if you want to use more traditional magic. Uh, it does give you some thoughts in here um, how to do that, but it's still the the hit point costs there for the um, magic. Modern and future weapons. Some suggestions if you're coming from it says other traditions. That's a nice way to put it. So if you wanted to use or to bring in. Um, like how would you um, convert from a percentile system or a 3D6 system or a dice pool system? So it gives you some thoughts on that. And let's see what else we're going to talk about. Oh, gives you some couple other character classes. These are optional. The Brave is kind of a neat class. It's almost like a, um, like a Hobbit class or Sam um, Gamgee you could think of where he's brave but not necessarily an accomplished fighter or something. Now, the brave character gets some advantages when they lose an auction. So if you're not using auctions, you may want to add a little extra advantage or something for the brave. Uh, the fortunate, that's kind of a noble class. So think maybe about Princess Leia where you know they're born and they have certain advantages because their nobles are very wise. Um, gives you some thoughts if you want to use species as class, like the old elf class from way back in the day um, in D&D. And let's just skip ahead a little bit. Oh, bases. Bases are nice or a unique thing. Uh, again, they also grant you advantage. Now, a base doesn't necessarily have to be a base, like the bunker in Supernatural could be a base. But it could also be a patron who helps you, like a powerful wizard or an elf queen or something like that. So that's an option for you here, too. And then it gets into how to run the game. This is more like referee advice. Oh, do you want to use a literary setting? You know, do you want to play in 
Tolkien's world or um, a more modern setting. And you can do that with this book because, you know, your fighter doesn't necessarily have to only be an old school fighter. You just would change maybe the um, groups that they belong to. You know, like I said, for Supernatural, maybe they belong to the British Men of Letters or something, if you're familiar with that show. So he does suggest in here that you could use this in um, other settings. Gives kind of a sample dungeon here or how to construct a sample dungeon and a little map. Uh, not really a full sample adventure, though. I always like when books have at least something for a sample adventure. Uh, this one doesn't. Um, so just be aware of that. And some random tables. These would be useful even if you don't want to play this game. So maybe for an NPC, you roll on this D20 here. And are they a fake personality? Or are they cursed? Or are they guilty of something? Um, so it does give you some thoughts on that. And some campaign advice. Now, monsters are really simplified here, but they really do suggest, for example, this is a first tribe orc. So suggesting making your monsters a little bit more than just orc and to bring something into that. And just a few sample monsters. I mean, there's no huge monster manual here. But there is a monster listing here with their hit dice. It goes by their, their hit dice. It's alphabetical. And what special abilities they have. Isn't this a nice simple monster block? So it gives you a lot of them. Um, pretty much your standard monsters from um, anywhere else. And magical artifacts. And an appendix. And then we get into the open game license and an index. And that's the book. So let's wrap up the video by talking about, well, who should buy White Hack? If you're a DM who really likes toolkit kind of books, like if you've read the Fudge book um, or Fate, where you kind of have to bring a little bit of something and you want to create your own game, White Hack is certainly one possibility. Especially if you're looking for a lighter fantasy game. If you need a, you know, if you like a little bit more rules light system, this might definitely be for you. Also, it's a good place to mine for some new ideas. There's things I saw in here that I haven't seen in other um, books. Now, they may be there, but I, I haven't come across them before. Like the idea of using the, con uh, the character continuing on as a ghost if they've passed away for the remainder of that session. Uh, like that idea of auctions, um, if you like that. And there's a few other ideas in here, like, um, well, what happens when you go to zero hit points and some things I didn't quite get into in the review. But you can certainly read that um, if you're interested. Now, one thing to mention, it's very text heavy and kind of text dense, I think I would say. There's not a lot of um, illustrations and there's not a lot of like breaking it up into charts and things to make it easy to find things. It's not impossible, but you do, you do have to kind of get familiar with the rule book to use it well. So again, White Hack is one of those things that I would say, just be aware, some assembly required, but a lot of good ideas in it. And if you'd like to check out the titles from Sharp Mountain Games, you can see our two in-print adventures, The Dwarven Pickup Truck and The Sky Tree at Amazon, Lulu, or Drive Through RPG. You can also check out our digital titles, which include adventures, map packs, new character classes, and character cards, and they're at Drive Through RPG or the Roll20 Marketplace. Wherever you like to shop, odds are that we're there. So you know what to do if you like the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. All the links um, to our products are in the description below. And thanks, and we hope to see you again soon. 